All right, here we go. Benny the Butcher, welcome to Vlad TV. What's the word with you, G's? I'm finally here. Yeah, man, we have one of the the hardest new, what I would call a traditional street rapper. Mm -hmm. You know, following the footsteps of people like Beanie Siegel, Cool G Rap, Scarface. Most definitely, that's definitely know. my lane. You know, who bring that street music based on personal experience. When you can actually feel the the realness bleed through the lyrics. No, facts. You know, when I listen to Benny the Butcher, that that's the feeling that I get. Yeah, that's my thing, evoking emotion. That's my thing. That's what I try to do, pull emotion. Yeah, man, you accomplish it. Yeah, man, thank you, baby. Have, I've been having a good year. Yeah, man, you know, uh, last night at SOBs, I heard you ask the crowd if you should do a Vlad TV interview or not. Oh, they told me not to. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, yeah. I mean, you mentioned me on uh, Massacre. Right, 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 right. Where, uh, you remember the line? Yeah, why these rappers, I said, these niggas never seen a half ounce. Why, why they rap about racks and act out these war stories on Vlad Couch? Well, I mean, we've had a lot of really authentic dudes. No, that's a fact. That's a fact. I'm watching a couple of my homeboys. I'm watching. I'm in tune. Yeah, don't don't get it twisted that we just have a bunch of wannabes and people making up shit. No, I'm watching. I see I see you have my boy surf on here, but it's been a shit show up here a couple times, man. I done seen some shit. And I'm like, seriously. I don't know, like, it's it's some dudes that you have on here that I never even seen them. But besides being on here, you know what I mean? You know how it is. Well, I mean, we've had Freeway Ricky, right, right, who's right, right. One of the biggest drug dealers. You know, you know in who your, you know who the fa you know who my favorite dude who you be having on here. Fuck, man, the OG, the Crip, Trey D. Uh, I like him too. I like him. Knockout, knockout. BG knockout. I, lo I love him. You know what I'm saying? I like him, man. He a good dude. I like him. I never met him, but I, I watched the interviews. I like that dude. Yeah, that's the homie right there. That's a regular guest, yeah, and yeah. Uh, got a really interesting perspective on things. Right, right, you right. You know, we try to, I mean, honestly, whoever we bring on, whether it's it's a rapper, whether it's a, you know, a street guy, whether it's a finance person. Right. It has to be real and it has to be authentic and it has to be, you know, based on reality. Facts, and, facts. And, uh, you know, we've been doing it now for 11 years and we're going to continue to do what no, we that's do. that's a fact, man. You know, I heard about you when, you know, some people started DMing me and they were like, oh, you got mentioned in this one song. So I started, uh, I started going through the catalog. And uh, and uh, I mean, first of all, Rubber Bands and Weight mm. is uh, incredible. Thank that's you. that's my favorite song that I've heard of you so far. And thank you, thank you. You know, you know, I haven't heard every single song on every single project, mm -hmm. but you know, when I started going through it, that song right there was like stand out. Repeat, 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 repeat. You know that '97 Ho, that was the next one that that hit me. You know, both of those off Tana Talk Right, 3. right, right. Yeah, that did a lot for me. People, that Rubber Bands and Weight, I hear that all the time. People fuck with that song. They like that shit. Yeah, that that right there, just the way the beat. That's what, Alchemist? Yeah, yeah, Al did that, man. Shout out to Uncle Al. Yeah, and actually, I remember I hit, I hit Alchemist. I texted him. We don't talk all the time, but, you know, I hit him out the blue, and I'm like, hey, man, I've been sleeping on Benny the Butcher. His response was, Butcher recognized Butcher, because my old name was DJ Vlad the Butcher. Oh word! You know, yeah. When I was doing mixtapes with Green Lantern and them, you know. Oh yeah, so you, so you, so you, so you in on this butcher shit, huh? Yeah, yeah. Just by chance, I didn't think about it at the time, but hey, man, that's what it is. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming in, uh, and let's go ahead and get into it then. Let's do it. So you grew up in Buffalo, right? Right. East side. So tell me what Buffalo was like, because you know, upstate New York doesn't get a lot of shine. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, I mean, Rick James came from from Buffalo, right, right, right. But but no no real prominent rappers or rap groups, none at all. So what was Buffalo like back then when you were growing up? Man, Buffalo, as a kid, it was it was it was. I was a kid growing up. It was a rough city, like any other city. But Buffalo is a little bit more smaller than other cities, so it's real. It's real personal. You feel what I'm saying? Like if. If we got an issue going on, we're going to bump into each other. You feel what I'm saying? Uh, everybody know each other, baby mama. You know what I mean? It's like it's, it's, real, it's real small, so it's real, it's real personal. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, uh, it's on a rust belt. You know what I mean? Uh, fucking, the economy is fucked up there. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a poor city. It's a city. This, this is my personal opinion. 
like if you if you from my side, the east side and shit like that, it's not it's nothing really too much going on. You know what I'm saying? But for the greater Buffalo, for the suburban areas and for the different areas, like Buffalo, good city. It's a lot of things going on. But for 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 our culture, you know, it's no it's no spots to hang out at. You know, niggas shoot them shits up all the time. It's no it's really no nothing to do. You know what I'm saying? We gotta we gotta get our shit together there. Well, you had said that your your mother was on drugs growing mm-hmm. up. Uh, was it crack, uh, heroin? What was it? Uh man, she my mom was a smoker. You know what okay. I'm saying? She kicked the habit. She been clean for like 15 years now. Okay, but as a kid, your mom was still using. Yeah, when I was a kid, yep. Okay, and I, I have people close to me that grew up in that kind of environment, and, and I've heard absolute horror stories. Right, right, right. You know, Mom, stuff that I can't even mention on camera. No, real shit, because in that era, I mean, like, late 90s, late 80s, early 90s, you already know, like, shit was terrible. That's, that's like the height of it, you know what I'm saying? And, and shout out to my mom. She came out of that shit clean. She raised her kids, and you know what I mean. And and and, and that was a lot to go through for her. A single a single mother taking care of all those kids. I got eight brothers and sisters. All together, it's eight of us. You feel what I'm saying? Uh, God bless the dead machine gun. Her oldest, he passed away. You know what I'm saying? So, shout out to my mom. You know what I mean? That that was that was like coming out of coming out of a war zone. You know what I'm saying? Okay, eight kids. Uh, different fathers. Hell yeah! You know how this ghetto shit go. Different fathers. Uh, dads in and out. When we grow up, when we grow up, me and my uh, peers, nobody have fathers. You know what I'm saying? That's why we are fathers to our kids right now. We take the best care of our fathers because we learned the most from not having fathers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. So so here you have, I mean, eight kids is is crazy even in a two-parent home that's making a lot of money. Right, <laughs> like, right, right. So here here is a, a mother who doesn't have a lot of money, who, who has a drug habit, and there's eight children, so nine people in the house, plus whoever's coming and going. And were any of the fathers helping out at all? Like yeah, any yeah. Siblings? I got uh, two brothers and two sisters. They all got the same father. And I mean, my mom been married to him for like 20 years now. You know what I'm saying? So, now he been there with them. But like the first four, her first four, like we grew up a little different from her, from her second uh, group of four. You know what I mean? I, I was like... I got brothers and sisters who are like I'm I'm old enough to be their uncle and shit like that. Okay. What do you think was the hardest if you look at just one experience that was like, wow, like this was some fucked up shit to go through? When you think about that era, what do you think that was? Man, it's just it's just growing up, growing up in a hood and not having the shit that you see everybody else having and knowing it's not a chance you're gonna get it. I knew not to fix my mouth to ask my mom for shit because I was the second oldest. She got six kids under me. You know what I'm saying? And and I was always I was always known as the kid who could take care of myself, who could hold my own. So she really didn't put no emphasis on uh taking care of me financially. She gave me a whole lot of game that I that I survived off to this day off of. So that's that that was our relationship. But like that was the worst part of it. Like knowing not even to ask for shit. Christmas time coming, I'm not I'm not even asking for shit. I'm not even fixing my face. Some new shit come out sc- back to school shopping. I'm not even asking. If you tell me we going back to school shopping, we going. I'm not gonna ask because I'm not expecting to. Okay, now you have an older brother. Well, you had an older brother. Right, right. Still got him. He's still here with us. Okay, well, you had a brother who ended up dying in prison. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. He when he. He got when he got killed. I was in prison. Oh, when he got killed, you were in prison. Yeah, yeah. O- okay, so this is your your older brother. Right, right. Okay. Machine gun black, rest in peace. Okay. So, what exactly happened to him? Mm, well, he was he was hanging out. He was hanging out on a street that I lived on actually at the time, but I was in prison. He was hanging out. With some dudes who had certain shit going on, you know what I'm saying? My brother was a gangster, so they was telling them like, "Yo, them dudes be having niggas come through and shoot, shoot and doing shit like that." So you might not want to hang over there. But he was like, "Shit, I, you know what I mean? I'm good. I'm just gonna holler at my people." And just so happened he was stopping to holler at, holler at, holler at him, and it was a drive-by. Some dudes came through shooting, and he got hit. Now, how did you take that news? It was heavy on me. It was heavy on me. I was. I was 21 years old. I was in the feds, far away from home. I was in Kentucky, Ashland, Kentucky. It was heavy on me, you know what I'm saying? I would just imagine about like what the fuck my mom was going through, all type of shit. 
hard. I mean, the people that did it, were they ultimately caught, or you just don't know? I don't, I don't, I don't know what happened. Yeah. That's tough, man, when there's no closure. When it's just kind of hanging over and you just you have no idea. No, that's a fact. Okay, so what, and you were in prison at the time in Kentucky. Well, yeah, yeah. What what led up to you actually going to prison? Mm, I was just on a, uh, I was in prison on a, on a violation from my uh, fair parole, my fair probation for, uh, my original case was attempt to distribute. I violated, okay. you know, smoking weed, hanging out late, doing all that shit. I was still young, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't ready to, to finish that time on paper. Okay, and what got, got you into that hole? To the whole distribution game leading up to that. Well, I'm from I'm from like a, a hood in Buffalo. I'm saying Montana. That's why I got it on here. I'm from Montana Avenue, and it's like a it's a legendary it's a legendary block for like uh for heroin. You know what I'm saying? Growing up, the OGs around around my way they did their thing. Uh, the ones under them did their thing. In my era, we did our thing. And uh, that's all I saw. My my hood was my hood was like that. My hood made a lot of millionaires. My hood made a lot of dudes with money. It's like a, it's almost like a, it was like a dynasty. You feel what I'm saying? So you know that that's the cloth I was cut from. So it was almost second nature. All my OGs was doing it. You know what I'm saying I was the little homie. So it it was easy for me to get into it. Okay, how old were you when you first started dabbling? Mm, about fourteen. Okay. So you're 14 years old, and you start you start messing with heroin. We start selling heroin. Heroin is one of these drugs. You know, cocaine is bad, crack is bad, but heroin is on a slightly different level. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I remember, you know, I remember I interviewed Pee Wee Kirkland, mm-hmm. right, who was like the heroin kingpin of right, right. Harlem. And, you know, he said this never happened under his watch, mm-hmm. but... After I went away, then I found out about what you, a lot of what you talk about, which was guys owing guys money and then making guys eat dog shit in front of crowds. Dog shit in front of crowds. They're embarrassing. Make, having, making guys bring their woman, making their woman have sex with a dog. And you know when a dog reaches his peak, everything's open up like that. So when the dog pull out, what happens to her vagina? All them sick, disgusting things, and and which was a major reality of me, cause I, you talking about a game I'd give my life, but death before dishonor, cause that's how I saw the game, and and understood the game and loved the game, because it was no other game in terms of me as successful. It was I'd have went to that game, like really just disgusting like shit, and people would do it because the need, cause you would get so sick. Right, right. When, 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 you're, when you're withdrawing, that you would literally do anything to get some more heroin. No, real shit. So, I've seen, I seen, like, a lot of crazy shit. No, 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 no crazy shit like that, but just, you know, fiends trying to uh, rob dope boys. You know what I'm saying? Dope boys having to do shit to fiends for robbing them. You know what I'm saying? You know, they come, you know what I mean? I've seen a couple of niggas almost get stabbed with dope needles. You feel what I'm saying? It's like, my, my, my one block was like a, it was like a, Oh, a strip, a, a block that's like a mile long uh, neighborhood. It was, I, it, everything went on over there, so I seen it. Before I got into the life, I was born in that hood. I was born on Montana Avenue. So before I got in that life, I used to walk past the bus stop. I used to walk past these dudes and go to the bus stop. You feel what I'm saying? I used to be nervous. I was a kid. I was like in second grade. You know what I'm saying? I hear these dudes out here loud. They out here getting this money. I know they got guns on them, so I used to be like a little nervous to walk past them. I ain't know, you know what I'm saying. I was a kid, but... Ultimately, I grew up and those was my friends. Those became my close friends. Well, you know, that life is glamorized in music and it makes, you know, people make it sound like it's just all money and mm-hmm. girls, mm-hmm. but but a lot of loss comes with that. That's a fact. You know, from 14, when was the first time that, that you really took a big loss? Mm. Well, it's, it's a big loss from 14. Well, first, the day that I got arrested, when I was 18, that was a loss. But leading up to that, I done been in like a whole bunch of raids, police taking money and drugs and, you know what I'm saying, getting pulled over and police stealing money, stealing drugs. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 I done been in situations like dudes used to hide their shit in the yard, you know what I'm saying, and, and then go get in and hit a lick. You know, sometimes the police will steal it or other people will steal it, you know what I'm saying? But 
like growing up, getting a little deeper in it, like bigger losses came, shit like that came. But I was I was young around that time. Okay, so the police were actually dirty out there. Yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. Okay, I mean, because I guess once you get into the smaller towns, you know, I mean, compared to New York, Buffalo is a small town. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the police can get away with a lot more shit. Right. I feel like I feel like that's how police feel like got feel like they got to fight that type of crime that way. You feel what I'm saying? It's like they they going against the the dirtiest criminals, the meanest villains. I feel like police feel like they have to do that. You know what I mean? They just they just corrupt because they feel like they feel like that's right. They feel like they doing the right thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you could justify things. How you no, no, I'm not. It, I'm not justifying it like that. I'm no, just, I'm talking about them. About oh, yeah, yeah, them, they that's how they justify do it. it. Yeah. But what they don't realize is that you got on a blue uniform for a reason. Like if you, if you, if you, if that was the case, you would be on the other side with me. So I feel like a lot of times the shit that happened with police, they don't take the responsibility of wearing the uniform. You know what I mean? Okay. So, so at 18, you get busted, mm -hmm. and do you get prison time at that point? Hell yeah. How long? Like two joints. I was sentenced like two years. Young, youngest person in the whole jail. You know what I'm saying? I didn't. When I went, I was 18. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I'm thinking they was going to take me to a young man's jail, like for the young kids or some shit like that. But yeah. You know what I mean? Just. Okay. So here you are, a teenager. You get thrown in with a bunch of hardened criminals, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, how was that adjustment? Uh, it was it was like the streets. It was like the streets, cause like I said, I'm 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 from a I'm from a legendary hood. You know what I'm saying? So all I all I really had to say is where I from, where I was from. You know what I'm saying? It was it was dudes in there who was from where I was from, legends. And like I said, my 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 older brother, he was he was my co-defendant on the case. So it's like when I went at him, I got to go in the first couple weeks with him, and he kind of like showed me the ropes and shit. So I was straight. The same way you're going to be in the streets, that's how you're going to be in prison, man. Okay. So you come in, you do two years, you come out of 20. Do you change your direction or do you go back to what you are doing before? I go right back. I go right back. I'm saying that, that, that was, that's the nature of it. You know what I'm saying? I, I just went right back. Like that, that jail time wasn't enough. I didn't have no children at the time. It was, it was, it was like almost me being made. Or you went to the feds, you came home, you didn't tell. It was almost a good thing. That's how fucked up shit is in the streets. It was almost a good thing. Yeah, and a lot of times I hear how you you learn how, you know, to to fix your mistakes, you know, in right, prison. Right, right. Everyone's sitting around pretty much in like a university right. <laughs> teaching each other how to how to get around the law. Exactly, ex exactly what it is. You know what I'm saying? I met a lot of good people in there. A lot of good people. Okay. So you get out and you go right back to what you were doing again. Now, you end up getting getting uh, arrested again, or just violating parole after that? Just violating, just going on a run because I'm not because I'm too busy smoking weed and still be, being in the streets. So I just violate. You know what I mean? I knew I knew she was gonna violate me because when 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 I when I when I was feeling by this time I got a daughter now. You know what I'm saying? By this time I got a daughter now. So I knew she was gonna violate me. Because I told her, like, she told me to come in on Monday. So when I came in, I took my daughter with me just in case. She was going to try to lock me up to see. So as soon as she seen me with my daughter, she was like, come back tomorrow. So I knew what it was, so I just stopped going all in one. So in one of your interviews, uh, you said the biggest lesson I took away from prison is you'll lose everything. Facts. And it's interesting. I remember when I interviewed uh, Freeway Ricky. And when you when you when you when you doing it, you're thinking like you're gonna accumulate this stuff, and when you come home, you'll have that. Yeah, but when you came out, you had nothing. Nothing. So all this stuff that people were holding was all gone. Zero. That's what my next book is about. Mm. When I got out, what I had, how I had to start over. Right. The so you walked called, away. You you came in a multimillionaire and walked out. Zip. Dead broke. No motels. No apartment buildings. Uh, no tennis pros, you know, all the things that I thought would, uh, would hold together. And the people who were able to keep the property, uh, uh, the property became theirs. In their minds, it was their property. And they weren't trying to give it back to you? No, no. You know, I interviewed Lil D, who was the crack kingpin of Oakland. Mm -hmm. Same story. When you get all that time, 
you have to trust somebody. You got to let people owe money. You got to let people have your properties and their names. And majority of the guys that you will have a conversation with that did a bunch of those years, throughout those years, family and friends, they going to spend that money, man. Because they feel like you don't need it, though. Like they, In their mind, they say, all you need is some money to go to the commissary and get on the phone. You can expect that type of shit. When I said that, I was more as talking though, you know what I'm saying? You see what I've been through losing my brother while I was in there. I was speaking more as though on shit like that. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? I I, I did a, I ended up doing another bed and, you know what I'm saying? And and me and my wife after that bed ended up splitting up. So you would lose shit like that. You could always get the money back. You know what I'm saying? You could always get that other shit back. But when shit like that happened, you could lose time with your kids. You know what I'm saying? You could go do a, you could go do a bid and come back in seven years and and your daughter don't even look at you like her 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 father no more. She might look at you like a, somebody who coming in and out of her life. So you could lose shit like that. That's what I was speaking about. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like family and the support. You know what I mean? Of, the, of, the, of your friends and family. Okay, so then you do another bid after that. Yeah. So how many years? So two years the first time. How much for the violation? Uh. Two years the first time, a year on a violation, and then I end up catching a whole nother joint do two more. Okay, so now you're five years in total. Yep, total, five. And you're how old? Mm, after after I did the violation, after I did that year violation, like I was came back out, I was more doing more rap shit, so that was a, in a different chapter of my life. I went back and did that when I was like 27. Okay, so a lot of your 20s, you know, late teens, tw early 20s were spent in a cage, pretty much. That's a fact. Okay. What was the moment when you said, okay, I, I can't keep doing this because if I keep repeating this pattern, they're going to give me longer and longer sentences. I'm not going to come back in a year or two. I'm going to end up getting 20 years. I'm going to end up getting life. Mm, a couple years ago, when, when I was going hard in the streets, and it was getting a, and it was getting the attention of people I didn't want want uh, who had a attention. You feel what I'm saying? It's like people was coming up up to us and telling telling us that they know somebody who worked for somebody and our names was coming up. You feel what I'm saying? And and people was coming to, people was coming to us like they was acting like they were scared for me. Like yo man, they heard just be careful man. Or you know what I mean? I, I I rep Black Soprano family. You know what I'm saying? That's that's my team and that's my label outside of Griselda. So. Like when, when the Buffalo Police Department painted that as a gang. Like if you was on parole and you wore a Black Soprano family shirt, hat to parole, they'd make you take it off right then and there. And they'd question, question you about people. Like and still to this day, they'd be on that type of shit. But when that first started, that really hit me like, yo, this might not end well. You know what I'm saying? I still didn't stop because I didn't have an out. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we've, when you're from the streets, you only, you only, you got more options, but we feel as though we only got a few options. And at that point in time, I didn't have an out. So to be honest with you, I stuck down and I stayed I stayed in the game until I felt like I had an out. Until like, really until Wes told me that he was about to sign a record deal. Like that's when I was like all the way hands off. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have an interview with, with Big Meech and you know, they didn't catch him with nothing. They, mm -hmm. It was all conspiracy. It was right. all other people. You know, he never talked on the phone. He never got caught with any drugs or whatever else. A whole bunch of people pointed the finger. The feds came in and built their, their case against them. And it was like, you know, they don't even have to catch you. Yeah, they, they, they don't. You know, they could they could paint that picture and you're done. And that's what they do. And that's what they're doing to my man Duffel Bag Hottie right now. He's facing 20 years right now. So all they do is, they, all they're doing is, they they putting a whole bunch of charges and a whole bunch of propaganda on him and they throwing him in the cage with a bull. The bull being the federal government, the judge and the jury. And if he make it out, the truth come out. If he make it out, he make it out. But if he don't, he don't. That's how they that's that's they that's they tactic. That's how they do it. They put you in a situation and make you fight for your life. And if you make it out, you make it out. And if you don't, you don't. Yeah, man. I mean, especially the feds was a 95, 98% conviction rate. Yeah. You, you know, know it's no joke. Them. You know, I just interviewed Irv Gotti uh, for the first time, and he beat a fed case, which is unheard of. They offered us where each one of us could do like six months, Chris could stay and run the company, then he goes in and does six months. Okay, so could. six months. It Basi was bullshit. Basically nothing. Yeah. But yeah. you turn it down. To my lawyers, to which our lawyers said, we can't guarantee victory. So our lawyers, who we had great lawyers, Shargell and Leftcourt, if I don't want you to get in trouble, but if you do call them, 
<laughs> they're fucking great, right? You don't want to use them, but if you do have to use them, they're brilliant. So our brilliant lawyers was like, take it. They didn't say take it, but they was they was like, wouldn't have been mad if we just said, fuck it, we'll take it. Yeah, that's legendary. In trial. That's legendary. In trial, he beat a Fed case. Real shit. Like, you just don't see that. But he spent like $10 million <laughs> to beat it. So, <sighs> you know, and, and it kind of destroyed his company in the process. So, yeah. You, so you that's all they wanted. No matter what. That's all they wanted. They succeeded. So, you got to be careful with them people. You know what I'm saying? You really got to be careful with them people. That's why, to be honest with you, I kind of talk freely about it and, and let people know what me and my friends is going on because. It's like harassment, what we, what we going through with the feds. So I let everybody know so they can't snatch niggas up and then niggas in jail crying harassment. Like, before this came, before they even snatched my niggas up, like, I was preaching this. I was, I was saying, I was speaking out against it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, luckily, you're not doing none of that shit no more. Oh, you're man, my, hand, my, hands is, my hands are so clean. Yeah. And, and this is what I always say, man, like, don't don't rap about illegal shit and do interviews about illegal shit if you're still doing illegal shit. Mm -hmm. You know, if yeah, it's but, all in the past. But you know what? You make it you so want. you make it so like, you know what I mean? They they can't help it. You know what I'm saying? You got the platform. You got a dope platform out, and it got a lot of views. And man, people, man, my brothers can't. A lot of my brothers can't handle that. You feel what I'm saying? And and that started with them though. You know what I mean? But a lot of them can't handle that, and. It's almost, it's almost, it's almost sad that you know what I mean, because it's the same thing that they love, is almost like being, you know what I mean. But let me ask you this, okay? Let me ask you this question right here. Let me ask you uh -huh. this. Now, if you got the platform and you know that, you know what I'm saying, like, what make you ask those questions like that? Uh, anyone who I talk to, I talk about past shit. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't interview people knowing they're still doing whatever whatever illegal shit in their present life. Right, right. You know, as I'm talking to them. We don't have those types of relationships. Right, right, and, right. And in fact, we, we've even, you know, it, you, you'll see certain interviews where it's like, oh, you have an open case? Let's not talk about it. Next question. Okay, right, you right. Know, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. you know, when I interviewed the baby, he still had an open case, you know, when he uh, killed that one dude in self-defense at Walmart. So I said, hey, we're just not going to talk about it. Now, I know everyone's going to, want me to ask about the Walmart situation, but we actually looked into it mm. and we saw that it's still an open case. Right, right, right. So therefore, I'm not gonna ask any questions about it whatsoever. That's cool. Let, let's go forward with it. And ultimately he got that case dropped. Right, right, right. Uh, but yeah, I, I respect it, man. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to put anyone's, you know, I'm, we've even turned down interviews with certain people who have open cases. Right, that like, makes sense. You, you're gonna end up talking about this and we don't wanna, potentially hurt whatever legal situation you have. Right, right. That makes sense. Okay, so uh, Conway and Westside Gun, those are your cousins? Yeah, those are my cousins. Okay, so you've known them your whole life? My whole fucking life. Were they rapping before you? Yeah, yeah. That's what kind of got me into it, because they, they, they a little older than me. Don't, don't, they my brother age. My brother who passed away, they his age. So that's how I started rapping. You know what I'm saying? When they was in the room fucking around on a, like a tape recorder rapping and beat bopping, I, I come in the room like, yo, shit, let me get a turn. But they didn't, they, you know what I mean? I tell the story all the time. They didn't even let me get a turn. Like I had to go downstairs and like, yo, they rapping, they won't let me get a turn. I was like four or five years old. I was young. You feel what I'm saying? So ever since then, this is what we've been doing, like making little tapes and, and just doing shit. It just evolved into this, you know what I'm saying? And, and West Side Gun, he always been a curator. He always been, he always had that leadership thing. He always like drew, drew the plays out. And we always was, you know what I'm saying, there with him. Okay. I mean, y'all are rapping together, but there's no hip hop scene, you know, in Buffalo like that in terms of like, there's no labels, there's no industry. Uh, it's all it's all a local thing, and there's no blueprint for other rappers that came before y'all. Right, right, right. So you so you guys are doing it without, you know, a very clear goal to where you're trying to be. Is that is that pretty accurate? No, that's at the that's, time? that's accurate. That's accurate. I'm saying ain't no ain't no manual for the shit. Let alone in Buffalo. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no ain't no labels we can go knock on the door to. There, there's no like old school legend rappers who can give us the game and coach us. 
And I'm saying there's none of that. So everything is everything was on the fly. You know what I'm saying? We are that now. You know what I'm saying? The blueprint in Buffalo is the Griselda blueprint now. You feel what I'm saying? But, okay, and, and Griselda, is that based on the, the, the female kingpin? Yeah, yeah. Okay, the what was her name? Griselda they did, uh, Blanco. Cocaine Cowboys on her. Yeah, the Cocaine Cowboy chick, man. The, uh, fucking the Cocaine Godmother, man. Right, crazy ass story. <laughs> I must watch that Cocaine Cowboy shit a thousand times. Yeah, I mean, we were actually supposed to interview the dude uh, who was in it, uh, but haven't been able to schedule him yet. Right, right, right. Um, okay, so so Griselda Records is a thing in in Buffalo. And, but you don't, you don't join until a little bit later. Right, right. I don't join. So, so how, how, how did you end up, you know, coming together on that? Okay, because now we all, we all been doing this thing together and we all veterans and been doing it together. So at some period of time, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Wes going to jail or, you know what I'm saying? Me going to jail or Conway getting shot. So. At a period of time, everything was scrambled. You know what I'm saying? Wes over here doing this, or Conway doing this, and I'm doing this. So I was just really, you know, Wes moved out of town, and Conway was with him, and I was just really in Buffalo. You know, everything is everywhere. In the middle of that, uh, one of my bids I was on, I was thinking like, yo, I want to come home, and I want to I want to reinvent shit. I'm going to start Black Soprano Family, da, da 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 That was later on, but I was really just doing my own thing, doing my own thing, and and they had, they, they was really starting on the underground scene. And they was all we family, so no matter what we was doing or how in touch we was with each other, they was always like, yo, I'm working on this project, get on this project, yo, get on this project. And the same thing I did with them. I'm gonna say in the middle of all, all of this. But uh 2016, when I get on the Fly God album, <clears throat> it's like I'm getting a little bit more hits on Twitter, I'm getting a little bit more hits on Instagram, and then I really figure out like what my cousin got going on. I'm like, oh shit, this nigga, like, he, he got fans and shit. And then I guess. He thought about it like he had a situation and he was putting it back together. It was all coming together. I know he felt like it was time that he he brought me along and make me a staple because I was doing my own thing. Like he hit me, he's like, yo, Buzz, no disrespect to you and what you got going on, but come fuck with me, da 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 And it was a no-brainer. I was like some shit I probably was waiting for him to say. You know what I'm saying? Okay. When did the, the Conway shooting situation happen? Was that like earlier, earlier or, or close to the, you know, to like to, you know, when you joined? Nah, it was... Well, people, it was it was 2012 because I had just came home. It was 2012. I had just came home, and uh, you know they 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 really start rocking and warming up the underground scene in 2014. So it is fairly fresh. Uh, that happened then, and man, Buzz a soldier, man. Buzz, man. I don't know. I don't many know too many niggas, man, who can survive headshots and shit like that. Well, he got shot in the back of the head. Mm-hmm. And the neck, and the neck, and the doctors told him that he'd be paralyzed from the neck down. Mm-hmm. Did you go see him in the, in the hospital when that happened? No, I didn't. I didn't. I was fresh coming home. I didn't want to. I didn't. I didn't want to see him like that. I didn't want to see him. But as soon as he came home and they told me he was good, they was like, "Yo, he got shot." Da, da, da. Go see him. I'm like, man, I don't want to see Buzz like that. You know, I just lost my brother. All type of so much shit going on. This shit. This shit, have, this shit have put you under in some deep depression. You know what I'm saying? I don't, I don't like going to funerals. I don't like none of that shit because I've been to so many. But I didn't go see him. But miraculously, he was he was he when he got out the hospital. I went to the house. You know what I'm saying? And that's where everybody congregating went to go see him at. I went to go talk to him at the house. He was fucked up. He barely could walk. He had a cane on and shit like that. Right and. When he finally does heal up, half of his face is paralyzed, which I guess is called uh, Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy. Okay. Most people would say, all right, well, my rap career is over. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't. I have problems even speaking right now. Right. But he went the exact opposite direction. Yeah, he did. He did. And I remember being in a studio his first couple sessions. You know what I'm saying? I remember here it sound it sounds different now because he 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 perfected the way he got he gotten used to it. You feel what I'm saying? But he used to he used to it used to sound a little funny when he first started. And I remember being in the studio and seeing him come back in there and saying like he about to record. I'm like, well, this nigga about to record something. I'm like, yo, I'm like this nigga. I'm like he that nigga. He got heart. You know what I'm saying? That shit inspired the fuck out of me. 
Yeah, I mean, it almost reminds me of the of the Bushwick Bill situation. You know, Bushwick Bill shot himself in the eye, and uh, you know they use that shit for the album cover. <laughs> you know, right, the Ghetto right. Boys album cover. It's like you take this extremely traumatic experience and you just flip it into something unique about yourself and you just rock with it. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty impressive. You know, no, when I went is. through the research, I'm like, damn. It is, man. And he a strong dude. You know, people get in the comments and they say weird shit. They don't know what he been through. They you know what I mean? People people ain't never been through nothing like that, let alone making a joke on a comment. They, they don't know what that hospital bed feel like. They don't know what them shells feel like. And here he is back. Shook all of that, you know what I'm saying, and doing his thing. So man, shout out to Buzz, man. I, I I could I couldn't even imagine going through nothing like that myself. Yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe at some point I'll interview him. We'll talk about that whole situation. I'd like to get his perspective on it, because um, I think it's dope that he completely flipped that shit into something that you're not gonna forget when you when you see him and you know see the whole presentation of it, man. Dope. Okay. So, so you guys, you know, he, he gets over that and continues to rap. You guys start to, to build up. Um, and then the Eminem thing comes together mm-hmm. a few, a few years later. That was a, what, like 2016, 17? Mm, 17. They probably early 17. So it was in the works. 16. Okay. And Eminem, well, number one, doesn't sign a lot of people. Period. Right, right. You know, not, not not a lot. A lot of people go through shady records as long as they've been around. Uh, and he had a tendency to fuck with Detroit people, mm-hmm. you know, outside of outside of Fifty Cent. But you know, a lot a lot of Detroit rappers. But here is a bunch of dudes from Buffalo that Eminem is starting to fuck with. Like, how did that whole thing come together? Man, really. Uh, Wes could tell you more about that because he's the one who finessed that situation. But what I what I do know is. Is that he was talking to uh, Mike and Paul about uh, management, and then you know what I'm saying, and then like kicking it with Paul Rosenberg and Mike, that just ultimately turned into a deal. But it was going to be something management first. But they talked. I remember he was taking taking meetings and going back and forth to the city, and and that's what it turned into. Okay, and then Griselda Records. Signs to Shady Records. Crazy. I remember when he told me that shit. He didn't tell me. He didn't tell me until it was like about to happen. You feel what I'm saying? He didn't tell me until I was it was about to happen. Like the ink, I think it was signed. I think that was signed in December of 2016. Yeah, an announcement was made 2017. So he didn't let me know until October. You feel what I'm saying? He knew he couldn't tell me. He knew that would have fucked my head up. You know what I'm saying? I would have, you know what I mean? Like, what? We about to, we, we about to what? So, yeah, man, shout out to Buzz. He put that together. Like, niggas, niggas don't, like you said, Marshall don't sign niggas. You know what I'm saying? He don't, he don't, he don't do that to niggas. So, he saw something in him. He saw something in Wes and Conway that, that made him want to make that move. So, okay. But you yourself are not signed uh, to Shady. Mm mm. Okay. So, it's just, uh, West Side Gun and Conway, the yeah, two of them yep. are signed. Okay, and Griselda Records is like a separate entity. Yep, yep. Griselda Record, Griselda Records is Griselda Records is West Side Gun shit. You know what I'm saying? And I'm signed to Griselda Records. That's what I'm through. That's what my shit come through. You know what I'm saying? Like I always say, everybody at Shady is family, but my contract not over there. I'm with Griselda Records. Okay, so so the two of them signed, which automatically raises the 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 whole visibility aspect to facts to insane levels because really like i mean eminem i mean you could argue who the best rapper is until you're blue in the face but fan base wise eminem probably has the biggest worldwide fan base of any rapper yeah far far as like music sell for sell he probably like the most successful rapper you know what i'm saying yeah. so it's dope it's dope that you know what i mean that we get to be a part of that and and that's that's what that's what we want people to see through us, man. It, it's the people who 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 not saying who stamp us because we don't need to be stamped, but it's the people who going who putting their neck out to say like, yo, these them niggas. You know what I'm saying? All, all everybody got to do is just pay attention to those dudes. Everybody you know, love and respect from the golden era of hip hop will tell you that. So the deal comes together, and you're and you're a part of the crew that 
the signs with, with Eminem. And at one point, you actually get to meet Eminem. Right. How's that like? It's crazy, man. It's fucking M. I met him at the BT, uh, the BT cipher, when he uh, was kicking that shit about Donald Trump. You know what I'm saying? It's I got the spit. I spit in that cipher too. You know what I mean? Took some pictures and shit. Chopped it up with him for a while, and you know what I mean? Just gauge. Just I'm like, damn, this M right here. You know what I mean? I, I, I be looking for niggas to talk when I be around them, cause I be trying to steal game. You know what I mean? If they talk and it ain't stealing, I be trying to get game from niggas. But I'm like, damn, this M. It felt like it felt like a point. It felt like it made me feel like things are moving along. You know what I mean? Shit's happening. This Eminem right here. Absolutely, absolutely. So the deal happens, and you start dropping shit. I guess through through Empire. Mm, yeah, yeah. My, my Tanner Talk Three came out through Empire. That was my first album, but I was dropping mixtapes. Uh, my first brick, Butcher on Steroids, Stabbed and Shot a Friend of Ours. All of that leading up to the album. You know what I'm saying? I did Tanner Talk okay. Three with Empire. Okay, and and is is West Side Gun and Conway? They're dropping projects too, but are they through Shady Records or are they independent? Kind of like man, independent kind of. You know what I'm saying? Like we still run this like an independent label. You know what I mean? Our right. first our first Shady release is coming out. It's coming out on Shady Interscope. It's called What Was Shane Gonna Do? Named after my brother who passed. But we haven't yet to drop a, a major release. And, and we just cooking, you know what I'm saying? They got a relationship with the label where they respect that. We just cooking it and, and getting the fans up and getting, the, and, you know what I mean? And getting the awareness up, you know what I'm saying? No, I think that's amazing because you don't hear that situation happen very often. When you sign with a label, usually at that point, all the music you release is through that label. They own the masters. They control it. They they set the direction. X Y you know X Y Z. Right. But right. Eminem being being you know the lyricist and and kind of lover of hip hop that he is, I think he kind of realized you know let these dudes do their own thing, and then once they continue to build up, we'll drop the big release through Shady. But allowing you guys to do what you do is actually. I never even heard of this shit. Like, <laughs> well, it's different. You know what I'm saying? It's different. Like, uh, to me, a, a crew like us haven't came a while in a came around in a while. You know what I'm saying? Or if we do, the the sound is different. A crew like us with this sound that started in the streets and that automatically like ballooned in to what it's on its way to and what it is today. Like you said, I think M got a certain respect for that, and he know what it takes. He know he know. He know what Wes and them doing is not hurting nothing. It's, it's ultimately helping because they just getting their buzz up for the big releases. It's, it's simple, really. Okay, and I'm looking through your discography, and you're just dropping shit like one after another. Like, let me see how far I can go back. I mean, 2015, you dropped Cocaine Cowboys. 2016, One on a One. 2016 again, My First Break. 2017, Butcher on Steroids. 2018, Stabbed and Shot. Man, I'm an 2018, animal. 2018 again, Friend of Ours. And then Tana Talk 3 comes out, which I think that's the project that kind of puts you on a different space. Yeah, guaranteed. It's a no-brainer. That's a fact. Right, and that and that's, you know, I had mentioned before, my favorite being the Butcher songs. Yeah, man, thank you, you man. Know, so it's a lot Rubber of people. bands of weight and, and 97 Hove. Uh, 97 Hove was kind of interesting. Uh, how did that come together? Mm, you know what? That beat, that beat just just made me like, took me back to that uh, the streets is watching feel. And and I don't know. I just I just I just said that in the bar. And I wanted to make that a theme. That's what I do. Sometimes I say lines. Well, really, that's all I do. I say a line in my song, and, and then I turn that into a whole theme. And I say the line, and I'm like, you know what? I want to create the whole feeling of the 97 whole. So, so that's what I did. I named it that, and I said a couple lines in the, in the verse to tie it back in. But it was just me trying to be creative and, you know what I'm saying, to pay homage to uh, somebody who, who I looked up to and who I, uh, you know what I'm saying, took a lot of game from. Well, after dropping 97 Hove, you meet 2019 Hove. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah. And you actually end up linking up with Jay-Z. Right, right. We had a chat. Okay. And you end up signing to Rock Nation, I guess, for management? Who said that? Uh, you know. There's a... Let's, let's see. Where did I hear it? 
<laughs> who said that? Who who said that? You know, I don't just throw stuff out there. Well, uh, well, here we go on uh, Respect Mag. Uh, boom boom, Bane the Butcher uh, announced his new project, Plugs I Met, who's now under management of Rock Nation. Mm. That's what it says. People, I, people assume that because I talk, because I don't know, but am I signed to Rock Nation? I'm not right now. I'm not. You know You're what I'm not. saying? I'm not right now. Those my guys You're, over there. We kicking it and we talking, but when every when everything is everything, the world gonna know. I'm a, it ain't gonna be nothing to speculate. You know what I'm saying? The whole world gonna know. Okay, fair enough. I mean, if you're saying it's not true, it's not true. Uh, but you did have some conversations with Jay-Z. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did those go? Man, giving me a lot of game, you know what I'm saying? Telling me how it was coming up when he was doing the music and, and he was in the game and telling me his future plans, what he working on, and telling me that he listened to the album. And, and he, he made a couple points in the conversation where it's like he was references like, yo, that's what we was doing. So he was basically saying like he see a lot of the old Rockefeller and us, how we was moving. You know what I'm saying? Just confirming a lot of confirming to us a lot of things that we thought we was doing right, that we are doing right. You know what I'm saying? Just being being like a guy, you know what I'm saying, as the OGs in the game should be to help keep us on track, you know what I'm saying? Cause this shit could turn into a shit so show. So, you know what I'm saying? He was just being hove. You see how he out working and uh, looking out for niggas, man, helping niggas with their bail and helping niggas with their cases. So, like he he was just playing that role and giving and giving niggas some games, some new niggas in the industry. He, you know what I mean? He was coaching us. Well, yeah, and I said this in the beginning. You know, when I when I was comparing what you do to other rappers, Beanie Siegel was the first person that I mentioned because mm-hmm. that that kind of aggressive style that you do. Reminds me of of how when Beanie was doing his thing at his height, and, and no. that is by far a compliment. Now hell yeah, hell yeah, I is I, I definitely took a page out of that book. You know what I'm saying? I definitely took a page out of that book. The 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 vivid imagery. You know what I'm saying the pictures that uh Beans paint, uh, using his life as as a main. You know what I'm saying as a main focus of where he get the inspiration from the bars come from it. The syllables and the street shit, like, yeah, hell yeah. Like, I, the reason, the truth, those albums that I played religiously. Well, I guess Jay-Z told you to turn down the XXL uh, freshman cover? Yeah. Okay, so were you officially offered the freshman cover? Yeah. Aha. Okay, and you turned them down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 to be honest, like, it was, it was always a 50-50 thing because... To me, it's not about. To me, it's about the look. You know what I'm saying? I can't be. I can't be like. I gotta do what I gotta do. You know what I'm saying? I can't. I can't jump in nobody's lane so to be convenient for me for a couple weeks, and that's not me. You know what I'm saying? And he just helped me realize that, and just reassured me. It's like, man, don't, don't, don't ever feel like you need to do this. You know what I'm saying? Do you? You know what I'm saying? He t- he told me about how a situation where he ended up turning some shit down and it worked out for him. You know what I'm saying? And he told me about how. He seen somebody turn some shit down, so he that taught him, and then he turned. You know what I mean, so it's like okay, he he giving me game right here. I, t- I took it and ran with it. Yeah, man. I mean, the thing about I mean, especially if you talk about entertainment, like y- y- you'll really define your career over the things you turn down, rather than some of the things that you accept. Right, because, real shit, real shit. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, you know, you there's always. There's always going to be fast money to do shit that you're going to regret later. Mm-hmm. Always, always. Just like, for example, we don't, um, you know, we don't take money for interviews. No, I could tell. Uh, I could I, tell you ain't taking no money for interview because if it was, you it'd be all, you 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 have fucking money bags sent back there like Scrooge McDuck, and it'd be all type of weirdos up here telling like, yeah, no, I I, I shot Ronnie. And then I, I, I shot Cliff, and it'd be all type of shit. It'd, don't don't never take no money from nobody, please don't. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we've turned out twenty thousand dollar offers, like you know, ooh, to ooh. do interviews. Uh, tell them they can bring that to me. I interview a nigga for twenty thousand. <laughs> I right now they can tell me everything the fuck they want to say. I post it right on my page too. 
Well, I mean, because you have to, there's a certain level of integrity that your platform has to stand on. Mm-hmm. You know, like when you talk about Jay-Z, you can't pay Jay-Z to get on a song. Right. He right. has to want it. He has to want to do that song. Right, right, right. That's and a And then fact. the money doesn't even really matter if there is any, any money. Like, you know, same thing with like a Kanye and all the greats, I feel, are the ones who really pick and choose what it is they want to do. And, and there's a lot of dudes who, who are good but but they'll take money to do whatever. The wackest motherfucker will give them ten racks and they'll they'll spit on their shit and go home. You know, no real shit. Um, you know, and listen, everyone got their own hustle. I'm not I'm not judging one or another, but I think that you know to achieve greatness, like you know, you look at all the biggest hip hop platforms out there. You know, you you know you can't pay to get on those. Mm-mm. You know, and and that's that's the whole thing. So hey man, listen, if you turning down the double XL freshman cover. You know, that's dope, man. I commend you for that shit. Yeah, man. And plus, like, I'm not a freshman. I'm saying you just named, you named, just ran back and named off shits from 2016 to 2015. I've been like a staple in Buffalo. And I mean, mind you, the Buffalo is small and the market is small, but that's why Griselda could, could move how we move right now. And that comes from all the experience, the 10 years of experience, the 10, 15 years of experience before anybody ever even heard of my name. That's what that come from, you know what I'm saying? Well, you dropped a new project. Yes. Uh, the Plugs I Met. Yes. Which had, uh, was it Tony Montana and Salsa on yeah. the cover? Yeah. With, with, with white bars on their face? Nice, nice. That's my to, signature. To, 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 to avoid the copyright issues, I, I assume? Nah, I'm independent. I can do what I want, you know what I'm saying? I can do what I want. Nobody's calling and, my phone. Uh, not really. You know copyrights saying? are copyrights. You Man, can't really I, listen. Ain't nobody. <laughs> by the time they tap into me, it it it, it, it the, my the register done ringed off. Like you see, it's out. It was stayed in top five on iTunes charts for a whole week. Ain't nobody called me yet. I'm good. And yeah, no, I'm just I'm just fucking with you. you. I mean, there's no there's no issues here anyway. No, I'm just saying uh, like, but you're right. Because if I would have did that with a label, they that was the first thing they would have said. It's like, no, we can't use this cover, Benny. What are you doing? That would have been the first shit they would have said. So, I like this independent shit. Well, th- this project has got less tracks, uh, yeah. well, half the tracks of your, of your previous one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the features on this stepped up a notch, right? So, I mean, the first one th- that you know I noticed was Pusher T. Mm-hmm. Uh, how'd you guys link up? I just hit him up. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just hit him up. I had I met him previously before. You know what I'm saying, and so I knew he was pre- he was uh, like familiar with the work, and uh, I was working on a project, and I felt called plugs I met. You know what I'm saying? I feel like yo, if I'm gonna reach out anytime, I'm gonna reach out. I'm not an egotistical nigga. You know what I'm saying? I'm not here. I'm not here for all that. I left all that shit behind me. I'm not here to be like, man, I can't hit this nigga up. Like I'm still a fan at the at the end of the day. So I'm like, that's what I wanted. I, I hit him up, and he hit me right back. He he tapped in. He and and the record got done, and it's a classic. It's like. He passed the torch to me, so shout out to Push for that. Well, and then you have Black Thought. Mm. The motherfucking, yo. Who, Black Thought, too. Not too many niggas could get thought on the track. Not too many people. Yeah, now, I remember me and uh, me and Lord Jamar, we kind of, you know, who's a regular guest on the show, we had this big debate where, where I said that Black Thought wasn't a top 10, you know, an all-time top 10 MC. Strictly as an MC, I would not put him on my top list. I felt he's a great person in the role of the roots, but him as an MC period, I wouldn't put him in the in the same breath as a Jay-Z, Biggie, Nas, Tupac, J. Cole. Listen. Um I, I can No, keep I wouldn't names. because that's that's those are different. See, you got, there's so many different nuances to this Rakim, shit. Rakim, KRS-One, if out you from all these guys. you a hip-hop motherfucker, there's so many nuances to this shit and different layers and levels that you just don't understand. Like, like Black Thought is not supposed to be talked about with a Jay-Z and those type of MCs necessarily. But, but when you talk about just real, lyrical, pure... Hip hop motherfuckers, like yo, he's gotta be one of the top motherfuckers in that. And it's not about sales again. 
You see what I'm saying? I'm not, it's I'm not, not talking even about, about sales. records that he had. I'm talking about this motherfucker got bars and bars and bars. You know, we, we were arguing back and forth. I never I never said he was whack. I never said he wasn't tight. I just mm -hmm. wouldn't put him in, a, in my top 10. And th this, this, this argument, debate started to escalate on social media and Black Dot started to kind of, Black Dot even called me. <laughs> I was like, yo, <laughs> like, <laughs> yo, I'm a fan of Black TV. Why are you doing me like this? And I'm like, well, I'm just, I'm just keeping it 100. Like, I, I think you're tight. I just wouldn't put you in my top 10 list. And then, and then Black Thought dropped that um, that flex freestyle, and I'm like, all right, I gotta go back and redo my top ten list. Like, right, he he right made there. you rearrange it. Right, right, right. He, he made me rearrange it, and I and I got on camera and I and I said that because what he did in that freestyle in one take was phenomenal. I'm gonna have to say, mm. first and foremost, oh shit, considering that at the end of that freestyle. Flex said one take. I might have to say that might be the best freestyle that I've ever heard. I agree. I agree. I watched that. Yeah. Uh, how'd you guys link up? Mm, same thing, man. I hit him up. Now, don't go out hitting these niggas up. Y'all not the butcher. Don't go out doing this shit. But like I said, I knew he was familiar with the work and uh, through a mutual party. A mutual friend and shit like that. So really, it's not like I was reaching in the dark with either one of them. You feel what I'm saying? I just had the courage to do it. They hit me right back. You know what I'm saying? Man, much respect to those dudes because that show how tapped in that they are and that show how down to earth that they are to even do that. Like I said, they didn't have to do that, but they wanted to do it. And they knew what that meant. They knew what that meant for me. They knew that's like an extra notch for me. So a lot of time it'd be gatekeepers in hip hop and they don't want to give nobody the extra notch and shit like that. So... Man, hats off to those dudes on so many levels for even doing that. But I just reached out to Thought. He hit me back, exchanged numbers in. You know what I'm saying? Made it happen. Dope record, too. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you. Crowns for yeah. Kings. You know, when you do a certain type of music, you know, whether you call it gangster rap, reality rap, street music, whatever you want to call it, and you move around, you go city to city, people are going to see whether you're really live in the shit that you're rapping about. Uh, I guess there was a situation when you were on tour with the Locks, like a, a fight in the crowd with West Side Gun. On oh, Cincinnati. It wasn't like okay. a it wasn't like a fight in the crowd. It depends. It was kind of like two incidents. Uh, but one in Cincinnati and like a, some small shit in Rochester. But you know what I mean? It's like it really wasn't no fight. It okay. was like an all stage, like I think West Side Gun like fucking threw the mic in the crowd and hit somebody and shit. Okay. Uh, what was your situation with G Herbo's uh, G Herbo's chain and getting it back? <laughs> uh, really, that night I was doing a sh I was Her G Herbo had a show. You know that's my homie, man. Shout out to homie. He he doing everything. He I'm saying he elevating. I love that, man. I love to see the young. The young king's grind, man. He turning into he turning into that nigga. But I was doing a song with him. I was doing a song with him, right? And uh, I was telling him, I was telling him, come through the studio. I was telling him to come through the studio. Like I didn't know, I didn't know what had happened with his shit. I didn't know what had happened to his shit. He had this situation with the girl. I really don't know how that. I just know that my little homies was fans of his and they fuck with him, you know what I'm saying? My little homie Miser, God bless the dead, he knew the bitch, so he ended up getting it back from her. You feel what I'm saying? He ended up getting it back from her. So when 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 Herb was telling him like, yo shit, y'all got it, meet me here. He told him to come to my studio, but they was already on their way over there because they was they was with me. You know what I'm saying? They was like, yo, you G Herb coming through the studio, we going there, ah. So they was like, meet me here. He was like, shit, I'm already going over there. So I'm saying I really I ain't had no hand in it. That was something the little homies did. Okay, so what, a girl ended up stealing the chain from him. That's yeah, man, I think I think that's what happened. Like she did some sneaky shit while he was sleeping in the room, or while he like dipped out the room, or some crazy shit. You know how these bitches get crazy. Yeah, man, put your shit in the safe. <laughs> Make sure she doesn't see the the combination. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you're gonna be doing. Just sometimes you just gotta not take your shit off, or you know what I'm saying. Oh yeah, man, you hear about this situation. I mean, people get caught caught slipping, you know, 
not even just getting their chain snatched, but showing up on live and, you know, videos and all that type of shit. Um, you know, and you guys have a real interesting kind of fan base. Uh, you know, here's here's a group of dudes who who have no huge radio singles. You know, they're not, they're not, you know, like in the top 10, you know, they don't have any pop songs, in the, you know, in the top 10 uh, billboard charts. But you guys really bring out the crowds and really have a big following. Mm-hmm. You, you know, what do you think is the key to that? Man, I think <clears throat> the key to it is the music. Like, who the fuck, who, who, like, who needs the radio, like, right now? Like... All the playlists on Spotify and Tidal and iTunes and Amazon Music, like who literally listens to the fucking radio? You feel what I'm saying? It's like you don't you don't go to the radio for culture no more or to find a new hot shit no more. The radio was the radio was like you. They gonna listen to some shit that they feel is hot and then they gonna spin it or they gonna take check take a check or direction from a label and then they spin it. But I feel like man, you know, it's it's the it's the uh, the internet age, and people got so much access to the music just by pressing the button. All we got to do is load it up on a computer, and people going to go get it. People actually going to not listen to the radio to stream the music. So I feel like once the old days is over, how the record labels used to do it, and uh, the artists got more control of how the music is distributed, and the fans got more control because they can just go listen to the music, I think that, that definitely play a part in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, your merch game... Is is on another level. Mm-hmm. I mean, you guys have like what, like two hundred dollars shirts that people buy. Facts: two hundred dollars shirts, jerseys. He did the fly guy kicks. Two hundred dollars hoodies. You know what I'm saying? I'm about to come out with the Air Max ninety sevens, all type of shit. Oh, you gonna have your own Air Max ninety sevens? Yeah, yeah. Because you people know those my that's my favorite Air Max. I'm like one of the Air Max kings out here. You know what I mean? So ninety sevens is my favorite. So it's only right that I would design a pair. Yeah, man, it's dope. I think you guys are really, uh, you know, really setting the bar for what an independent crew could do without the help Mm -hmm. of a major label. Yeah, yeah. Even though you have the, the, you know, the possibility that, okay, boom, this project right here could be upstreamed and it could be on on Shady and so forth and we can get the Eminem features and, you know, he could could help out with whatever other features y'all may need. But you guys are saying, nah, that's cool, but we're going to grind it out, create our own projects independently, create our own merch, do our own tours without needing the help. Right. And I think it's amazing. Right. And and all the help, when you're in a situation like that, all the help you get from a label or whatever, that's just extra. You know what I mean? I feel like it's important to, to operate that way because it's people looking they looking towards us for the music and looking towards us for the merch and understand that we responsible for that instead of just shady, shady, shady. You know what I'm saying? Like if you got a if you got a situation where like even even my boy, my uh my right hand man, City Boy, like he he like with the Black Soprano family, he run our merch and everything. I really don't even post it on my page like that, you know what I'm saying? Because he posted on his page to get his own flow. So don't make people feel like they got to come to my page to get it. Go to him. And now he got his own flow with it. And that's the same thing with the uh, fires, the record company, is that they see it's a Griselda flow and more people get behind it. Not saying they won't get behind it if it's shady, but you know people like that shit. We the underdogs. It's a lot of uh, real estate and being an underdog, man. People want to see you win. I feel like people enjoy seeing us win right now, knowing we the underdogs. Coming from Buffalo, not a borough. You know what I mean? The, uh, the kind of music we do. We not uh, choosing to fucking jump around and do all that hippity hoppity shit. I think people take a lot of pride in that and enjoy seeing us win. Well, listen, man, Bang the Butcher. Uh, I'm definitely a big fan. Before we even did this interview, uh, you know, you could hit up Alchemist, ask him about how how we were chopping up, you know, about you. Well, before this interview, uh, I think what you're doing is is dope. Uh, put out some some really really dope tracks and I, I mean I'm not surprised that Jay-Z you know stepped in and you know wants to fuck with you I'm not surprised at all it makes perfect sense considering the type of music that Jay-Z uh fucks with and, and creates and the type of shit that you do right, I mean, right when I heard about it I said yeah okay yeah <laughs> that makes perfect sense uh so man listen uh congratulations on everything you've accomplished 
and uh, it sounds like you're just only getting started. Yeah, man, I'm only getting started, just warming up, man, practicing my J. <laughs> no doubt, man. Until next time. Peace. All right, G's.